It is Palm Sunday this morning, and so that is what we'll have sort of as our, as our theme for the message. See, last week we saw that regardless of what people might want to think, that Jesus came to this world with a particular mission that he was out to achieve. We also saw that Though Jesus' mission was foretold by the the prophets, that it was not really the mission that his disciples were were hoping for, and that that thought and that theme continues today. We saw that delivering over, the delivering over of Jesus to die by the hands of the the Gentiles, by by both the, the Jewish leaders and by God, we saw how that helped to fulfill his mission. And then we saw also both the reluctance of Jesus' disciples to understand that mission. It was a mission that they really didn't want to hear about. And then on the, the other side, we saw the determination of Jesus to march forward and fulfill that mission of salvation. And then we saw at the end how we are now to, to join in Jesus' saving mission to help build God's kingdom through salvation, through the gospel. So now today we see the the next steps of Jesus' path to Jerusalem. We see this on his coming on Palm Sunday. And we also see how it leads also to the fulfillment of his mission, how he would accomplish all that was necessary. So our message this morning is they knew who Jesus was, And our text is Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. Luke 19, starting at verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering it you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it just as, they had, as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they, brought, and they brought it to Jesus, and throwing down their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So far the reading of God's holy word. There is always a a tension within the church about our our being faithful followers of Christ and of us wanting our mission fulfilled instead. We're not always on the the same page as what Jesus is, and sometimes I'm not even sure if Jesus' church is even in the, the same book as what Jesus is any longer. But last week we saw the disciples struggling with their their desire for their mission over Christ's mission. They wanted their way and not his. Still we see that this struggle was was common when when Jesus came to our earth. The Jews wanted a a particular Christ or Messiah that would accomplish a, a particular thing. They had particular goals that they wanted the Messiah to fulfill and it was primarily an earthly mission that they, that they saw. 
They wanted a Jesus under their own terms who would fulfill their mission and not necessarily his mission. They knew what they wanted from Jesus. They knew what they expected out of their Messiah. And the truth is that they would accept none other but the one that they wanted. And the Jesus or the Messiah they wanted, they expected to come to overthrow Rome and reestablish David's throne or kingdom in Jerusalem. They saw that as the, the goal, a kingdom that would place Israel over every other nation. And we could see how attractive that would be. What a wonderful place that would be to say, we rule over the world. And that was really their, their heart's desire. The truth is that both for the, the Jews and the disciples, by placing their mission over Jesus, as they wanted another Christ. Not the, not the actual one that came, or at least they didn't want that one immediately. And today we see, too, that there is great pressure on the church to give the world the Jesus, the Jesus that they want, and not necessarily the Jesus that came, offering them a different Jesus. But we need to understand, to give into the pressure would be to deny them the true Jesus and the only way of salvation and to deny the true mission that Jesus came on. And so today in our text, we see this continued, ten ten this continued tension in our text as both of these, those who are accepting of Jesus and those who are rejecting of Jesus, wanted a different Messiah with a different mission, with an earthly mission, and again, we, we see that tension still within our, our church and our world today. And it's not as if they, they do not know who Jesus is. They simply do not want the real Christ. And so it seemed whichever view the people were holding then and oftentimes still hold today, they were not happy with the Jesus that came and they were not happy with his mission and now we see some of that played out again in our text today as we saw already last week. So first, building on last week, we can see Jesus' determination as he draws closer to Jerusalem and fulfilling his mission. He would accomplish his goal. He would accomplish his purpose. He would do the Father's will. He would do what he was sent for. We must see that Jesus knew that it was not a throne awaiting him in Jerusalem, but a cruel cross. In a way, we might even see these vast crowds as, as almost a distraction to Jesus as he drew near to Jerusalem. As we think about this, we should be reminded of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness where the devil laid before him the, the kingdoms Basically saying you can have all these kingdoms without the cross. And we can imagine here that the devil was tempting Jesus also. Tempting Jesus to take the easy way out. Just take the throne, ignore the cross. And we take the safe way, find the easy way. The temptation that he gives each of us and a temptation that he gives his, his church yet to always find the safe way but Jesus would not Jesus would not take the safe way and neither can we so we see that Jesus would not be distracted from his mission he would accomplish what he was sent for and then throughout Jesus' ministry, we saw that oftentimes he intentionally hid his true identity. How he, how he sort of stepped back at times so, so people wouldn't really understand. But, but now we see on Palm Sunday that that veil is fully removed. Jesus' grand entrance into Jerusalem made it clear to Israel and to everyone who he really is. All would be able to see the, the real Jesus, 
and in less than a week or in a week they'd be able to begin to see his true mission as the promised Messiah. And so we too must, must see this in our text to see who is this Jesus? Why did he come? And is he the Jesus that we follow? So our text opens now with Jesus sending his disciples. And the picture here is that his disciples were dispatched with kingly authority. Jesus, as the king, sends his people to go to and fro to do his bidding. And that day, Jesus would truly be treated like, like royalty. They would treat him in a kingly fashion. And his disciples would, would go quickly and do their king's bidding by getting the colt, the colt of a donkey, we, we see too that they were fulfilling prophecy. Again, pointing to who this Jesus really is. The tying and the untying of the colt pointed to Jacob's prophecy about Judah and about the, about the ruler who would rise up from Judah. And so we see even in such a little thing as untying the colt, pointed us to who this Jesus really is. And then we see in our text that immediately the, the colt's owners also submitted to Jesus. The Lord had need. And so the objections, the questions all fell by the wayside. And then we even get another hint, a hint of who Jesus really is as the disciples went there and found everything as he said it was going to be. It was laid out exactly as Jesus had declared. Jesus' prophetic abilities here spoke that, that he was the king. And it also told us so much more of the identity of our king. But we need to also understand that prophetic ability, that Jesus also knew that his actions here would help trigger the Jewish leader's deadly plot against him. Jesus knew what going to Jerusalem would do, the process that would be started, and what he would face. He knew that this would be a plot that would lead to a cross. And yet in that, we also see he knew that that was the fulfillment of his mission. And second... What transpired on Mount Olives and the winding road to Jerusalem was, was surely a, a kingly welcome. Again, the, the picture in the text is that they knew who Jesus was. There, there wasn't a lot of doubt in this crowd. We need to understand that the pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for the, the Passover were steeped in messianic prophecies, oftentimes more so than, than even the locals in Jerusalem were. And seeing Jesus on the, the colt would have reminded them of Zechariah 9, 9, where we read, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Certainly they would have seen this and seen that Jesus was the coming king. They would have certainly seen the connections here and laying down their, their cloaks and waving the palm branches, as it speaks about in the, the other Gospels, meant that the people knew. They had no doubt who this Jesus was. We see in our text that they are immediately treating him as, as royalty, showing him respect. By laying down their cloaks, they were paving the way for Jesus to enter Jerusalem, to ascend to David's throne. That is what they wanted. That's what they were expecting on that day. That was the mission that they wanted for Jesus to be on, even if it was a different mission than what he saw. And the waving of the palm branches on the road showed Jesus' honor. In a way, we would see this as, as like a ticker tape parade where people would line the streets and throw things 
showing honor and, and respect for the one before them. In that day and age, the, the palm branches were a way of people welcoming dignitaries, welcoming them into their city, giving them honor, and showing that they were honored simply by being allowed in their presence. We also need to understand that this text hardly does justice to this, this great event of what was all going on. See, with Jesus' disciples, there were also probably a million or more pilgrims that had come in for the Passover that, that were already at Jerusalem or on their way. So the, the crowds would have been massive. This wasn't like a little protest or a little gathering of a few hundred people here or a few hundred people there. This was, this was thousands, thousands upon thousands. And the roar that they would have had would have, would have gone through the valley. People would have heard this for miles. The cry probably would have been loud enough to maybe even have gone all the way down to, to Jericho. This was, was a stunning event. So we need to, to sort of see what was going. This was a massive gathering outside of Jerusalem. And then we, within the group, we can imagine all the chatter about Jesus too. Oh, did you see this? Did you hear that? Do you understand that he did this or said that? And the mighty works that they would have praised Jesus for that day included the the raising Lazarus from the dead. You can imagine in their minds, knowing something like that, they would have had to say, certainly this is the promised one. Who can do what, what Jesus did? Imagine if we knew somebody who had raised somebody from the dead was coming. How would we treat them? How would we be part of that event? Jesus, simply by the power of his word, called Lazarus out of the tomb and gave him life. And these people knew that. So imagine, imagine the excitement that day. And so these pilgrims certainly sensed that this was God's long-promised Messiah coming to them. This is what they had hoped for. Year after year, generation after generation, looking forward to the day when God's Messiah would come. That he would come and deliver his people. And the people of that day had visions of grandeur about Jesus the King. To them, Rome's fall would be, would be imminent. If this was the king, if this was the salvation that he was bringing, soon Rome would fall. Soon the David's throne would be raised up. Soon their, their oppressors would be thrown out. Their earthly problems would, would all be put away. As a, I was thinking about this a little bit, in a way... They had what a, a view of what's called liberation theology that looks at, at Jesus as only a savior from oppression. We think sometimes, oh, that's a new thought that we've had in the, the past century, but already the peoples back then had that same view. Jesus is going to save us from the Romans. He's going to lift us all up, and then we will be in charge. That's the, the message of the social gospel today. Jesus just comes to fix things in this life. And they forget his real mission. And we need to understand that if it, had been, if it had been up to this massive crowd that day, that Jesus would have been anointed the king. That is what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to be the king so Rome could be thrown out, and the quicker the better. And then they cried out, come in the name of the Lord. And that tells us that they knew Jesus was their promised Messiah. Coming to, to do the Lord's bidding, to fulfill the prophecies. And the Messiah was to be God's representative. The Messiah would come and rule in the name of the Lord. That is what they were looking for. And the crowd quotes from Psalm 118, which speaks of the salvation 
of our Lord that points to God's long-promised Messiah, Deliverer, and Savior. But their hopes of a Savior was different from the Savior that came. And the salvation that they desired was not the saving mission that Jesus came to fulfill. Their kingly welcome was not welcoming the king they were hoping for. And this remains, this remains true even for our day, where people want to shape and change Jesus into the Jesus they want, instead of following and submitting to the Jesus who came. And then third, we need to see that the, the Pharisees here, they were a smaller group, it would have been a very small group compared to the rest of the crowd that was there that day. But they were wanting Jesus to rebuke the crowd, and they wanted that because they, they wanted Jesus to really deny that he was the king. See, because they already had positions of power, they already had positions of authority, and so they wanted a Jesus that would just leave them alone where they could maintain their own lifestyles, do as they pleased, and be the ones in charge. And so while the, the, the large group saw Jesus as the deliverer from the oppressors, the Pharisees feared the Jesus who might take their power away, because if he lifted up all them common people, what would be left to them? So they wanted Jesus to deny that, that he had anything to do with being the promised Messiah. They wanted Jesus to reject his kingship and say that he was not their king. They didn't want to follow the route that the common people were saying. But the truth is here that neither group, neither group wanted the true Jesus. Neither wanted the, the Jesus that the Father had sent into the world. So we need to understand that if Jesus had wanted the throne in Jerusalem that day, he could have taken it. This vast crowd, he could have marched in there. The Roman soldiers would have had little, if any, ability to stop them. At least not until reinforcements could have come. Yet it would be... Jesus' rejection and not his acceptance that would actually fulfill his mission. See, Jesus' mission wasn't be, to be come in there and, and take over Jerusalem. His mission wasn't to deliver them from Rome. His mission was to be a savior. And his mission was not their mission. Still, everyone... Everyone there on Palm Sunday knew exactly what the events of that day were declaring. Whether it was his disciples, whether it was all those pilgrims, whether it was the Pharisees, all of them knew that the events that day were declaring that Jesus was the promised Messiah come to fulfill God's will. They knew he was the one the prophets had spoken of. And though they understood the prophecy, again, Jesus was simply not the Messiah they wanted. And the Pharisees and the other leaders rejected Jesus. And within a few days, the rest of the people would also. They would reject him because he was not, he was not the Messiah. He was not the Christ that they wanted. And today, that is the battle that we have in our churches. We have churches throughout this land who are lifting up a Jesus who is not the Jesus of the Bible. They are lifting up a Christ who is not the Christ of the Bible. They are offering a salvation that is not the salvation of the Bible. And the same battle that Jesus had on Palm Sunday 
is the battle we still have today. In some ways, we need to say, I think, that the disciples, like last week, that these things are still in a way hidden from them. If it was hidden from the disciples, it was certainly hidden from the, the crowds. That they were in a way blinded, and we could see that the Jewish leaders were certainly hardened. In a part, in a part this was because God's mission needed to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And in part, again, it was because they wanted a different Jesus. They needed to look somewhere else to find a Jesus beside the one God had sent. And then we see sort of in a, in a stunning picture of the leaders of that day. We need to sort of understand what Jesus is saying. They say, well, well, stop these people from crying out. And Jesus says, if I stop them, the stones will, will start crying out. We have to understand how big of an insult that was to the, the Pharisees because they, really he's saying the, these stones, these stones on the pavement that we walk on have more spiritual life in them than you do. They know their creator. They know the Messiah. They would cry out, why don't you? It's pointing to the, the spiritual death in these leaders. They were but spiritual zombies. They went through the motions, but there was no life in them. And this remains true today of all of Jesus' foes and adversaries. They may speak, they may move, but spiritually they are but the walking dead. Yet we also have to see that God would use the rebellion against them. See, as the week would advance, they would think victory was theirs, but it would not be. Because not only could they not stop Jesus' mission, their hate would, would help fulfill that mission. It would lead to the cross. Because we need to understand from last week's task, text and this week's text and going into Holy Week that the cross had to come before the throne. We needed salvation before we could enter into the kingdom. That was Jesus' mission. And rejecting Jesus as their king, they would make way for Jesus to be raised king of king and lord of lord and savior of his people. The very things that they did not want to happen are the things that they caused to happen with their wicked intentions. As they sought to get rid of Jesus, Jesus would overcome the sin and rebellion of his people. And finally, though the rebellion against the true Jesus continues today in both our wicked world and in our wandering churches, the truth is we, we know too. See, the, the problem is not that people do not know who Jesus Christ is. The message has been boldly proclaimed throughout the world for, for many years. The problem is they do not want the Jesus that came. We find that in the world, but again today we also find that in our churches. And then as we saw in our first John series, from early on, people have tried to reinvent Jesus. To take the Jesus of the Bible and turn him into another Jesus with, as Paul spoke, with another gospel. And I want to just change gears here a little bit. This past week, I, 
I saw a video clip. A guy named Ibram Kendi, who writes a lot, talks a lot, on something called anti-racism. It's a huge part of the, the social justice movement today. And he spoke at speaking about his parents and also about himself a little bit, but talked about something called liberation theology. He compared that to what is Savior theology. And he talked about in liberation theology, Jesus is only here to help overthrow oppressors. That that was Jesus' mission to come into the world. It wasn't about fixing us or changing us or, or helping us overcome sin. It was simply because there's bad people in the world and you need help to overcome those oppressors. And so he, he began changing the Jesus. And then he decried Savior theology was what, is what we would hold to. That Jesus came to save sinners like us. And yet he re rejected that. That was not the Jesus he wanted and that was not the Jesus he would accept. He would not accept a Jesus or a church that would call people to change or to leave their sins behind. Because to him, that's not the gospel. To him, sin isn't the issue. To him, someone else's sin is the issue. Someone called oppressors is the issue. But Savior theology says there's something wrong with us. It's our sin that needs to be overcome. We're not to point at the other guy. It's us who needs salvation. And what we find is that he has invented another Jesus and he has invented another gospel. And we need to understand that when it comes to things called the, the social justice movement, this is what stands behind it. Churches and Christians must be aware of what's behind it. The Jesus they talk about is not the Jesus of the Bible, and the gospel they present does not lead to salvation. Shared with a little about that with the, the Sunday school class. And the thing that I that's just stunned me about this one, because usually false beliefs and heresies are, are sort of clouded and muddied so you can't really see them, is the clarity by which he spoke. He was so clear on his heresy, and every Christian who has any biblical sense should run from it. But so few will. Because they too oftentimes look for a different Jesus. And they too oftentimes want to hear another gospel. But we must see that it is sinful... It is sinful to reject the true Jesus and it is sinful to set up a Jesus of our own making. It is but an act of rebellion instead of submission. And shortly after now, the first Palm Sunday, the people realized Jesus was not the Jesus they wanted. And in killing him, they missed the Jesus that they needed. And that's what happens today. As people make up their own Jesus today, they miss the true Jesus. They miss the right Jesus. And that is why we cannot compromise on who Jesus is. Because the world at that point will miss the only Jesus who can save them. That's why we as churches must be strong in our doctrine, strong in our understanding of who Jesus is, what his mission was, and the salvation that he brought. That's just what should get our attention. 
That should be our focus. Yet even, even with all the struggles and even the attacks on the church, through the church, God is still fulfilling Jesus' mission. The gospel continues to, to go out through the world. Salvation continues to flow. Sinners continue to be saved. And there's good things that come out of these struggles. See, these struggles and attacks force us as believers and as churches to define and believe in the true Jesus Christ. They force us to go back to our scriptures and say, who is this Jesus and why did he come? We also have to see that these struggles help to define the wheat and the tares. Oftentimes the wheat and the tares look so close we, we can't tell the difference, but times like this you can begin to see the difference. When you begin to see those who you thought were wheat are all of a sudden standing with the world. Those who you thought were the wheat are all of a sudden promoting a gospel that is not the gospel. When you see them promoting a Jesus who is not the true Jesus. And we can begin to see the difference between those who once looked so much alike. We can begin to see that the distinctions are, are clear. We need to understand, too, that even today, people's hard-heartedness is being used to fulfill Jesus' mission, as it did with the Pharisees. Their hate, their anger advanced the gospel and did not stop it. And no, no matter how great the rebellion of the world and the false church, Jesus will succeed in his mission as he went to the cross and was raised from the dead, his final mission will be fully completed. And we must continue to move that mission forward as his people. We have to see, too, that this message of victory is also the message that we find in the book of Revelation. See, as Christians and as churches, we might look around this world and say, How's it ever going to work out? How are, we, how are we ever going to overcome? How are we ever going to make headway? And yet we, we can go to the book of Revelation. People fight over it, but they oftentimes miss the main point is that Jesus wins. The victory is already his. We're, we're not to be disheartened. We're not to feel downtrodden. Jesus has won. And that is the promise that we now continue to look to. Whatever we face, whatever struggles, whatever difficulties, whatever oppressions, Jesus wins and we can have the victory in him. And there will be a time when Jesus comes as king to rule. But before then, we are now to proclaim him as the only Savior, the only, only Savior. We're to be calling a lost world to repentance and faith. Yes, we are to call people out of their sins because that is what Jesus came for. He did not save us so we could stay where we're at. He saved us so that in the end we could be like him. And we can already do this because Jesus Christ is already reigning in heaven. How many of us know the Great Commission? How much power and authority has already been given to him? All. He reigns already today. The enemies may think they, they have advances. They may think they're gaining headway. In the end, it'll be nothing. Because Christ already rules. And he's already won. 
And as individuals and as the church, we must work diligently now to continue with Jesus' mission. Luke 19, 9 and 10, Jesus was speaking of Zacchaeus. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. And here we see with clarity Jesus' mission. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is to be our mission. Let us too now go forward to seek and to save the lost. So let us declare the Jesus, our Savior, to our wicked world and to our wandering churches today. See, they, they desperately need the Jesus of the Bible and not a Jesus who, who is a figment of their own imagination. For the only Jesus that saves is the Jesus of Scripture. So we must not ignore the true Jesus and the only Jesus who saves. And let us cling to the Jesus that we know. And let us tell a dying world of our wonderful Savior. And we need to be clear as individuals. We need to be clear as churches. No substitute will do. It is either the Jesus of the Bible as our Savior, or we have no Savior at all. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent your Son into this world. We thank you that there was nothing, nothing that would take his sights off of his mission. And Lord, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the victory of Resurrection Day. We thank you for the gospel, the salvation, our deliverance from sin. Lord, help us to celebrate that and help us to share that. Lord, help us to have opportunities, gives us the ability to speak so that we might tell others what a wonderful Savior we have and call them to look to you too in repentance and faith. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen.